So have you ever wondered, are you a good witness? Good evening, I'm Dan Haggerty. And I'm Laurel Porter. If you're walking downtown and you're suddenly robbed or you witness a crime, do you think you could remember important details like what color the crook's hair was or were they wearing shorts or jeans? It's a lot harder than you might think. Yeah, you don't say. And you know, we know that for a reason because of this. Our investigative reporter, Kyle Aboshi, put our newsroom to the test. He set up a scenario where our co workers witnessed what appeared to be a crime. Then all of those witnesses sat down with real life detectives to see what they remembered, if anything. And Kyle joins us now. Kyle, this was a pretty interesting and intense test. Indeed. We hear it all the time. Police tell us to be a good witness. So, what does that mean? To find out, we set up a test. Watch closely. You're about to witness what appears to be a crime, the theft of a camera. Hey, that guy's stealing our camera! The bad guy got away, but it's okay. This wasn't real. It was a simulation to help demonstrate how hard it is to be a good witness. As a police officer responding to a scene like this, um, you may have some very accurate descriptions and some not so accurate descriptions. To understand, we've got to back up a bit and explain our test. We told our co-workers to gather in the front lobby for what they thought was a promo shoot. Meanwhile, a guy pretending to be our bad guy approached the building. Our co-workers had no idea what would happen next. Hey, that guy's stealing our camera! So, this was all a simulation. This is not a prank. We're not looking to embarrass anybody. It's a test. And what we're doing is we're testing the ability to remember. Did you see the guy's hair? Did you see his clothing? Did he have a weapon? Do you remember anything about a what detective from the Washington County Sheriff's Office then not, interviewed not the witnesses so. one by one? Why don't you tell me what you saw? <laughs> uh, we were filming a promotion or so I thought. Kyle jumped in and said, somebody's stealing my camera or somebody's stealing the camera. And I looked up and saw somebody running with the camera. The guy had uh, the tripod in his right arm. Running away with it in his left hand. Was there anything that stood out about the clothes? Did you see any distinctive features, any colors, or was were they wearing Just a hat? Just dark. I, I, I want to say I, I think they were wearing a hat. And it seemed like he had reddish or brown hair. And I think he had like on a greenish gray sweatshirt. You remember anything else about the clothing? He was wearing shorts. Um, he was wearing shorts? I believe so. I thought I saw him wearing shorts. Um, dark pants? It looked to me all dark, all black, and almost kind of like he was dressed like a ninja or something. I don't know. <laughs> did, they, did they have a good description? There were 10 witnesses. Um, we got 10 similar stories. And we also got 10 somewhat different stories. Detective different Patrick Altair says it's not uncommon for witnesses to have a slightly different recollection. That's a problem with, with stress and, and a, a situation you're not used to being in is you start to, your mind fills in the gaps for you. So what can we do to be a better witness? First, stay calm, stay safe. We don't need people to try to stop these people. Then get a good description, focus on specifics. Obviously, you know, the generals are good, you know, clothing descriptions, um, approximate age, approximate height, approximate weight, you know, facial features, you know, race is important. But what will really help is specifics. If you get a chance, write down notes. It'll help you remember later. And if you can, take photos or shoot video. Hey, that guy's in our camera! Oh my God. A crime can occur at any time, and if you happen to see it, you can help police catch the bad guy by being a good witness. This exercise was a lot of fun, but we owe a big thank you to our coworkers. They had no idea what they were getting involved in, <laughs> and they played along. So for that, we say thank what you. What good sports. Dressed like a ninja. I right, love that right. one. And seriously, they did have some good uh, descriptions mm -hmm. of the suspects. Some very specific it descriptions. fast. Right, exactly. So generally speaking, they did a fine job. You went uh, like Daniel Day-Lewis on the acting <laughs> there, too. I was impressed. I had to sell it, right? You did. You, you definitely make it real, did. So give him my best. Thank you, Kyle. And when Kyle's not scaring the KGW team half to death, Kyle's also helping you get results when you think something's just not right. If you have something for him to investigate, you can call Kyle at 503-226-5041, or you can email him at callkyle at kgw.com.
So Democrats need to flip 23 seats on Election Day to take control of the House, and one of them just happens to be in southwest Washington. Republican Jamie Herrera Butler has held that office since 2010, but Democrat Carolyn Long is putting up a fierce fight. It is a tight race, and judging from the ads, it's getting pretty ugly, yeah, too. Uh, KGW's Pat Doris has a look now at where this race stands and some of the national attention it's picking up. We can't afford Carolyn Long. Long's health care plan would double our federal taxes. More lies from Jamie Herrera Butler. Her attacks on the Carolyn ads Long in the third congressional false, district false, race show false. just how tight Carolyn things are with less than two weeks to go. Each candidate says it's going well. The race is going really good. We feel very comfortable. The polling looks good. More important, we've got a great ground team. Um, we've got 1,600 volunteers, and we've been in the field since March. I'm energized. I feel good. I feel like people um, who maybe weren't paying attention, even in the summer months, um, are all kind of dialing down to, to see what's really shaping up as a contrast. The candidates differ on two big issues, taxes and health care. Herrera Butler embraces all the Trump tax breaks. Long says she favors them too, except the ones that give the big companies and the richest individuals breaks. I favor parts of the Trump tax bill. On health care, Long wants a public option for people buying health insurance and eventually a single payer health care system. Herrera Butler wants small business to be able to band together to reduce the cost of health insurance, caps on medical related lawsuits, and allow buying insurance across state lines. She is also firmly against a single payer system. We will dramatically add to the debt and the deficit. We will completely bankrupt Medicare as we know it. The third district stretches from the Columbia River to Centralia in the north and from the coast to Goldendale in the east. Herrera Butler said it favors her. It's very independent. It's not hardcore Republican, it's not hardcore Democrat, right? It's very uh, pragmatic and independent. Now, I think people break right of center, um, but they really want to see you working hard. They, they're who shape my values. But Long it says hard. it is changing in a way that favors her. There is. So one of the things that we've noticed the last several years is more people moving from the Portland metro area to Vancouver for a number of reasons, including job opportunities as well as the lower cost of housing. And so I think that is shifting at least the demographics in Clark County and could have an impact on this race. A New York Times poll found last week that Herrera Butler is in the lead, but Long was within the margin of error. In the two-year period of 2017 to 2018, by the way, Long has raised more money than the incumbent with $2,365,000. Herrera Butler has raised $2,062,000. Back to you. Pat, thank you so much. One of the many closely attended races that we'll be watching very closely. Uh, and as we speak about races in Oregon, for instance, voters have received at this point their mail-in ballots, but some folks on social media have been raising some questions about those. For instance, the Working Families endorsement. They're wondering what it is. It's under some of the candidates' names on that ballot, including Governor Kate Brown. Is it a political slogan, a party, possibly an ad? KGW investigative reporter Kristen Severance set out to verify what it all means. Incumbent Kate Brown's party affiliation is listed as Democrat slash working families on the November ballot. It's the same endorsement she received back in 2016. So what does it mean? Some on Twitter say it's a pack, slogan or ad and it shouldn't be on the ballot. Working Families is actually a minor political party with a presence in a handful of states, including Oregon. The party supports minimum wage increases, paid sick days, raising taxes on the wealthy and clean energy jobs. So how do they get their party on the ballot? In Oregon, it's completely legal for a candidate to be nominated by multiple parties. It's a completely legitimate part of the Oregon political system. It's not a political action. Group. It's not somebody who's coming in and giving contributions or whatever. It's actually the endorsement of a minor party in this case. So how does this benefit candidates like Kate Brown? Is a way for her to kind of shorthand tell people, I'm with you on these issues. And it's fair because her opponent, Newt Bueller, can get multiple nominations as well. In fact, he tried to get the independent nomination and was narrowly beat by Patrick Starnes. So we can verify working families is a legitimate party in Oregon, and it's completely legal to have them on the ballot. Answering the questions there, Kristen Severance doing some verifying for us tonight. If there's something that you want us to verify, you can email verify at KGW.com or message us on Facebook or Twitter.